Last session, we have uh, three papers, so each uh, uh, allocated to 35 minutes, despite uh, we are dealing with old people or, or the long run issues. Okay, first uh, paper is Anna Marie Lusardi's paper on debt and debt management among older, older adults. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. And when I was asked to contribute a paper, I thought that the topic that might best match some of the paper that we're going to present today is actually some of the recent work that I have been doing with Olivia Mitchell. So the advantage is that uh, I can get a lot of comments, but the disadvantage is that this is going to be uh, mostly a first look at the data and mostly some uh, preliminary uh, work. Uh, this. Uh, the project really came out of our interest in, the, in uh, working for several years on savings and really focused, for example, on saving for retirement and wealth accumulation for retirement. But then when we actually look at uh, all of the data, and in particular some of the new work that I've been doing with the regulator, the FINRA Investor Education Foundation, is what we really did see a lot of people struggling with is that and that management. So in this project, actually, we start to focus a lot more, not on the saving side, but actually on the debt side. And to understand this a little more, what we do, we actually focus on people very close to retirement. In fact, on the cusp of retirement, 56 to 61. So in principle, these are the people at the top or who should be at the top of the wealth accumulation. So we can actually see how, in a sense, how well they are doing when they are at the top of the wealth accumulation. And because that normally charges higher interest rate than saving, we can actually see, in a sense, whether you know, they are decreasingly getting rid of that or not. Um, what we, therefore, want to focus a little bit more is, I think, you know, this, this part of the balance sheet that perhaps we haven't as much focus on. And to understand this a lot more, at least for us, and because uh, in particular Olivia sits on the HRS committee and we have been able to add questions on these surveys, we're also trying to have also perspective on how that has changed over time for those people close to retirement. A lot of people have argued here that uh, opportunity to borrow have very much increased over time. Of course, for example, with the increase in home prices, being leveraged would also potentially give higher returns. But the problem of that is also will bring uh, more financial fragility to some of the household. And this is actually one of the things we want to look at uh, as well. Um, I want to complement some of the data from the HRS with the new work um, on the uh, National Financial Capability Study. This is literally work that the regulator um, has been doing. So we have a, we designed a first survey in 2009, which is really measuring financial capability. And also the second wave is now available in 2012. Uh, because this is not the survey consumer finances, we actually didn't uh, have the capability, the, the, the capacity, uh, I don't want to repeat the word capability since it's in the survey, um, to, for example, measure wealth, so value of wealth, of value of debt. So we had to look for indicators, for example, of how a household are doing, and I'm going to show you in a moment which type of indicator we have been looking at. But before I do so, let me um, start with a short literature review. I know that actually many people have written on this topic. I just want to indicate um, some, for example, the work that uh, David has been doing on looking at mistakes over the life cycle. So it seems that we, the mistakes peak, peak at age 53. So um, uh, we are looking at people past that age, um, but we are also uh, looking and try to actually uh, focus the attention a lot more on, uh, on debt because in fact, a lot of households arrive at retirement with a lot of debt. Um, the, the data we are looking at um, is going to be from the Health Retirement Survey. And since this has started in 1992, we have actually a richness of information we can focus on because we are actually looking at the older side of the Health Retirement uh, Study. What we are going to focus are people literally on the cusp of retirement, age 56 to 61. 
So we can actually look at the first uh, um, survey, which was done in 1992. So we have a perspective of what people at that age did. We can also follow a cohort, uh, which is the uh, war babies. They were interviewed in 1998 when they were 51 to 56, but four years later, we can actually follow them closer to retirement. Uh, same thing for the early boomers in 2004. We can look at them in 2008 when they are 56 to 61. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking at people on the verge of retirement um, at the age 56 to 61. So for example, a year before they could apply for early social security. The thing I want to show you here that over time, uh, what we do see for this uh, same generation we see that they are getting close to retirement with just a uh, uh, higher uh, uh, amount of debt. So uh, just the people who are getting at retirement for, with debt has increased, but the amount in particular has gone up, uh, both in terms of the uh, median, but in particular if you look, for example, at the uh, high end of the debt distribution, we see that actually in the, in the early baby boomer, um, the top 10% is actually more than $250,000. So one of the things that we have to think about is that a lot of the uh, management at retirement will have to do not just how to decumulate wealth, but also how to uh, manage debt at retirement and how to service the debt. Um, in terms of I an mean, important component of that is of course the mortgage. And what we see here as well is more people are getting close to retirement, having a mortgage, and also with higher uh, mortgage debt as well. And also loan, additional loan on the house in addition. So um, the proportion of people who have loan on the mortgage, for example, home equity line of credit has increased, and so has the amount. One of the reasons why this has happened is not only because people um, have borrowed more, but also because they bought larger homes and more expensive homes. So if you look at the houses, the home values, and there are more people, of course, uh, being homeowners among the early baby boomers, but we can certainly see that at all level of the distribution, here we are looking conditionally on having a home, they are actually buying much larger homes. And later on, I'm going to show they are also buying this larger home with lower down payments. So of course, their level of debt close to retirement has certainly gone up. What we are interested in is uh, some measure, for example, of uh, financial fragility of some measure of potential problem of this increase of debt in the economy. So what we do, we are actually looking at some simple ratio and uh, um, this is not just, by the way, uh, only um, um, mortgage debt. If you look at other sources of debt, for example, credit card, the medical debt, we also see an increase um, of that type of debt among, again, people close to retirement. Okay? And the value have actually gone up quite substantially. So um, what we do, we are actually looking at some crude measure of leverage. For example, how many people are getting close to retirement with total debt over total asset, where we are taking actually the uh, value of asset, including in this case, all of the value of wealth in the HRS. So we are including also business equity, vehicles, and other, for example, 401k, so some sort of also pension debt, and we Windsorize at the top uh, 0.5%. Uh, but what you see here is over time, um, we do see an increase in the proportion of people who are getting close to retirement, and their debt is, is actually greater than 50% the value of the asset. Um, this is the, their mortgage, this is due partly to the fact that their mortgage is also a higher proportion. So for example, if you look at the people who are getting close to retirement and they still have more than 50% of the house to pay off, that's, uh, that's much higher among the current generation. If we look at more short-term measure of financial fragility, so for example, the other debt, we are talking about credit card debt and medical debt mostly over liquid asset, 
and I'm considering liquid assets like saving account, checking account, bonds and stocks, we see that this also short-term potential measure of leverage, even in terms of being able to face uh, your short-term debt and pay them off with your liquid asset, has also increased over time. And finally, just to consider the possibility of facing a shock, uh, and we are taking actually a value of total net worth of 25,000 here, both because it is you know, half the amount of median uh, income, and also we are actually going to build in a moment another measure of financial fragility about the possibility, for example, of being able to raise a small amount of money to deal with the shock. Um, what we also see is that not just people have higher amount of debt, but they arrive at retirement with the total, uh, this is of course total wealth, but it does not include of course your pension and social security. Nevertheless, this is for example, the amount that you might have to rely on if you are faci facing shock. So as we can see here, um, you know, the potential for um, having more difficulties with debt has increased over time and is much more prevalent among the generation retiring uh, at age for, uh, you know, close to retirement in the year 2008. Now, what are some of the factors that can explain some of these uh, financial fragility? We have correlated some of these uh, simple measure, in particular this debt ratio, to some measure of shocks. Um, and here is just to have some idea of whether also the increase in the debt ratio can be related, for example, to uh, the low uh, economic activity, um, uh, income shocks, uh, health shocks, and so on. Um, and uh, it's, it's literally a, a very simple and uh, descriptive exercise. And what I want to highlight are actually some of the things that people have mentioned before me, which is that clearly when you look at this measure of financial fragility, as indicated by this having debt to asset ratio, uh, either total debt or liquid debt over a liquid asset, uh, over 50% on the cusp of retirement. First of all, even after we account for some economic condition, for example, your income, uh, being white, having children, having have poor health uh, in your total income, what we see is that the younger, uh, the generation in 2008 on the cusp of retirement still have uh, after even this accounting for other economic conditions, a uh, higher amount of wealth. Of course, we cannot distinguish age and time, uh, court and time effect here. Uh, it's just the evidence about this uh, newer generation in a sense. But what I want to highlight is of course the condition that allow you to do better. In other words, having higher income, being white and having less children is important. Uh, but I would like to also highlight a feature um, Raj has called it, this is the effect of, in the labor market and education and skills. Um, what I would like to argue is people which have a higher education, in particular this is college or greater than college, are even after that we account for income and other economic condition, better able in a sense to arrive at retirement with lower amount of debt ratio. So in other words, it's important uh, not just to in a sense, ensure yourself against shock, but also have the ability to manage resources and to manage those shocks. Um, I'm just reporting here for simplicity, looking at the sample, for example, the married couple versus the singles. And what you'll see here is, for example, among the singles, the shock are quantit quantitatively more important as we expect. So for example, having been hit by a health shock or having low income, in particular important for some of the single people versus the married couple. But I want to again um, highlight that certainly shocks and economic condition are important potentially to explain this arriving at the cusp of retirement with a lot of debt, but uh, we also see again, even after accounting for income, is a relatively important role of education. 
here is um, the uh, evidence, for example, for the uh, single uh, sample. Okay. So just to summarize this very, in a sense, uh, descriptive evidence from the health retirement study, um, you know, before we arrive um, at the kind of peak of the financial crisis, uh, families, and in fact, even before 2008, we see this increase in debt happening already in 2002. We see people starting to buy larger home already in 2002, and we see, we see people actually racking up credit card debt even before the uh, financial crisis happened. So of course, a lot of family had arrived at the cusp of this financial crisis being potentially more financially fragile. Uh, so the typical factor associated with financial fragility are economic condition, but also uh, being better educated um, and potentially having a higher capacity to deal with shocks or to manage uh, your wealth. I would like to complement some of this evidence with this very new survey. Um, this is uh, designed by the FINRA uh, National uh, Education Foundation. The first the survey became available in 2009, so we could actually compare the data in 2008 with the data in 2009. And what is actually interesting to see that the HRS and the 2009 National Financial Capability Study in the statistics we could actually match compare pretty well. So for example, in terms of a percentage of household arriving close to retirement with mortgages or with high percentage of mortgages, about, for example, credit card debt, and so on. Uh, but what uh, the more recent data allows to tell us as well is how are those older households doing, in a sense, after uh, the financial crisis. So the first thing I want to show you first is that there is a nice combination. We can say at least that there is some consistencies between um, the two data set, and we also can see of course, other statistics and other paper here as well, it's shown that not just people were able to borrow more, but also they were um, having down, uh, lower down payments. Um, but they, we also see that um, consistent with the data in 2008, many of the older households were also struggling, for example, about uh, paying credit card debt. We also have evidence about using high cost method of borrowing for example, payday loan, pawn shops, and auto title loan. So these are people who should be close at the top of their wealth accumulation. They are borrowing using method that charge more than 50% interest rate, sometimes even 300% interest rate. And that's actually not a small proportion of households. In fact, let me turn to the 2012 data where we have more detailed information about uh, this family and we can actually see what potentially this financial fragility had transformed into. What we see in the more recent data, if we look at the same age group, 51 to 61, is that, for example, of those people very close to retirement, literally potentially just a few years away from retirement, actually 31% pay the, pay the credit card as paying the minimum only, using the credit card for a cash advance, actually uh, and often paying late. Um, they have borrowed already on their retirement account, conditional on having uh, an account. Um, more than one in uh, five actually have unpaid medical bills, um, and more than one in five have used high cost method of borrowing. So these are the, for example, payday loan, pawn shops, and so on. One measure or two actually measure that we have designed in this specific survey to have some idea or to measure in the most simple way whether people, you know, what's the, whether people are indeed financially fragile or whether they struggle with that because we didn't have, or well, we couldn't have as many questions to have a very accurate measure of wealth, for example, and debt is we ask people about their debt and whether they think they have too much debt. 
We have also asked whether they'll be able to meet an emergency. So the question is how confident they are that they could come up with $2,000 in 30 days. So this is not, for example, a measure about you know, being able to come up with this today. This is actually a measure consistent in the sense of a short, you know, a medium shock like the car breaking down and being able to come up with that in 30 days. Somewhat, if you multiply this by 12, actually you get this kind of $25,000 of well that we have used in the other survey. When we look, for example, at this potential level of this measure of struggling or being financially fragile later in life, what we find again, uh, and here we have actually a much more rich, a richer data. For example, we were able to ask explicitly whether they experience a substantial drop in income in the past year. Um, what we have added to be more specific about education, we have also added, as I hope you were expecting, measure of financial literacy. So we have a five question, we have designed five question in the uh, financial capability study that actually really look at this uh, basic knowledge, but of fundamental ca concept about financial decision making. So this financial literacy index is actually a simple measure that uh, sum up the number of correct answer to those five questions. So we are better able in a sense to see whether, you know, first of all, are people on the cusp of retirement when they should have, they, whether they should be at the top of the wealth accumulation, how are they doing in terms of their debt? And we can see, and as I mentioned earlier, that more than one third of these households state that they have too much debt. Having too much debt is again correlated, of course, with being uh, hit by shock. Uh, for example, having had a large decrease in income in the past year, having dependent children, having lower income and lower education. But even accounting now for that lower education, Financial literacy, for example, has an effect above and beyond that measure of uh, education. So in other words, again, uh, shocks are important. How you, um, how you might be suffering from the effect of the crisis is important, but also the capacity, for example, to both accumulate wealth and to manage your debt is also important. We have looked at the second measure of whether people could come up with uh, $2,000 in 30 days. And uh, just let me show you back the statistics. Um, those, again, at the top of the wealth accumulation, uh, almost 40% of these older respondents told us they have too much debt or they uh, are not confident that they, will, they can come up with $2,000 in 30 days. When you look at their wealth, by the way, they have indeed very low wealth and they are also paying um, high uh, fees on their credit card. When we look at this other potential measure of financial fragility, we find very similar result where uh, shocks or economic situation where you have lower income, lower education, um, being hit by the income shock, which of course uh, was very substantial in this time period, uh, being non-white or, or female, is important to explain financial fragility, but so, for example, is education, and so is uh, the level of financial literacy. So the point that we really only want to bring with this very descriptive analysis is just highlight one important feature of balance sheet, which is you know, we should focus not just on saving and asset and asset, asset management, but it's actually very important to also pay attention to that and that management. We have just uh, actually looked at more, um, uh, in more detail, for example, at the data on uh, this high cost method of borrowing, uh, which, is, which are incredibly uh, striking, and uh, we have actually learned a lot from the work over there, but even at later in life, actually there is a, a, a very high proportion, um, given that this should be the people at the top of their wealth accumulation, of using this alternative method of borrowing with actually charge very high interest rate. And even at this high late, uh, high, 
uh, late age in the life cycle, we see uh, certainly a very heavy use of credit card. So my only um, suggestion today is that we need to also start paying attention at that, try to incorporate this debt more explicitly into our model, both because debt charges much higher interest rate and therefore can be more conducive to problems. But I also think that in terms of retirement planning, it seems that a high percentage of people at retirement, certainly this the new generation, will have to deal to how to service the debt, not just how to decumulate their wealth. Thank you. Just a quick question. You, you, you have some, some prior work with Peter Tufano about that's literacy and, and experience <coughs> with that. And I, I love the experience stuff that, that talks about how people that, and, and David also has work on this, how people learn how to do debt management. Um, have you pushed on that? Or are you going to push on that with this? Because I, in, in my view, which may be wrong, it's first order. Right. No, that's actually incredibly important. You know, it's very hard. I mean, of course, there is a potential endogeneity problem. I think when you look at that, it might be less, in my view, severe than when you look, for example, at asset. Um, um, so, you know, here is like learning uh, your debt because, you know, you want to, you know, borrow more or so, I think is uh, potentially less uh, relevant. But nevertheless, I think it's a very important concern. You know, we, in the second uh, round of the survey, we have really uh, thought very hard about instruments, right? Um, and but because financial literacy is, is a choice variable, and because in these type of intertemporal decisions, it's actually very, very hard to find, a, in a sense, a, a, a truly rigorous in instrument, or at least one that the referee seem to like, um, has been so hard. Which I think. Uh, which I think the you know really important way to go at this point is do really field work. So we are trying to complement this research with a lot more field work because the survey itself might not you know have the type of instrument which I think the um, you know people might uh, think exogenous. But we have added we have added a couple of instruments here um, that might work. And by the way, in all of the work I've seen, when you, when you instrument financial literacy. Um, the result, the estimates are actually larger, not smaller. Of course, you know, it could be because there is also measurement error, but I haven't seen an estimate actually going the other way. So, you know, maybe perhaps we are even underestimating the effect of financial literacy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this issue of debt management and the behavioral shift that seems to have taken place over at least my lifetime uh, between how my parents looked at their balance sheet and how we lived and, and what seems to be the case now. I mean, for example, just look at the commercials that run f with a high frequency on reverse mortgages, which speaks to this age cohort you're talking about mm -hmm. and, the, and the people who are plugging those things, the celebrities. Right. Uh, so the issue I have here is uh, I don't know, it's, I'm raising a, uh, an issue, and it, I don't know if there's a question in it, but if the, balance, the macro balance sheets of the federal government and the central banks are tied to the micro balance sheets of consumers who are endemically committed to debt borrowing and don't know how to manage debt, that has tremendous implications because you go, as I said before, from $700 billion to $4 trillion, because you're trying with brute force to help people unwind the debt as opposed to they're taking, I mean, I'm sure they're taking individual actions, but clearly the, the issue of how these balance sheets are tied is a major shift, I think. I don't know what the precedent is for it, whether it's the depression, et cetera, et cetera, but that link and breaking it so that people are able to act more volitionally and, and prepare more, it's a major challenge, right? I mean, yeah. it's the same challenge we find in food consumption and it's linked, linked to entitlement obligations and healthcare policy. If people are tied 
to a food industry which is pervasively committed to infusing sugar into food, and then we get type 2 diabetes as an issue, you're going to explode your health care course. So how, these linkages are just amazingly challenging from a policy perspective. I couldn't agree more in a sense. Actually, what worries me is what will happen to these people in a sense close to retirement as the tapering goes on and actually the interest rate are going to increase. And so the people close to retirement with this high amount of debt, I mean, th that could actually be quite an issue. Um, there is actually evidence that uh, um, some of this debt is pushing people to work longer. So there could be already some behavioral effect of having this amount of debt. Um, so it, you know, in my view, this is a, a potential concern about the financial fragility also of the economy if, I mean, this is just a specific cohort, uh, but this is the cohort, by the way, that should have, in a sense, potentially the lowest amount of debt. Uh, I mean, um, just an anecdote, in, your, in the academic profession, one of the professors that we bring on trips to Israel mentioned two years ago that our 401k was so impacted by 2008 that even though she's in her you know 60s she can't retire mm -hmm. and as a consequence the ability to elevate younger faculty members mm -hmm. is a little there's less flexibility right. and you can see that repeated in a lot of different professions Love. I'm the quintessential war baby. I was born exactly in the middle of World War II. Um, but my question is, uh, following up on this question about uh, reverse mortgages, do you, first of all, do you distinguish reverses from regular mortgages? Right. No, we can't here, so we don't have really information. Uh, and I don't think both they are sum up in, in here, though, because, uh, you know, we're, they really ask which type of mortgages they have. I assume also the reverse mortgages are most important for people after retirement than before retirement. And also, the, it seems to me that the reverse mortgages at the moment are a very tiny proportion of the market. But looking at this data, I think they are, they are probably going to you know, potentially grow larger, given that you know, that's the main amount of wealth that people have at retirement. Because I, as I understand, the numbers are kind of unfavorable. That you can either annuitize in a reverse mortgage or you can take out a lump sum, and almost everybody takes out a lump sum. Right. It's like the same problem as in retirement, that there's an incredible resistance to annuitization right. and a great tendency to take out a lump sum and then spend it on something and then not have, and then basically be living in a, of a shell that's not going to deliver any cash value when you, when you sell it. No, I think this is, you know, this is, I think, some indication, um, you know, of why this market might eventually develop. Um, again, at the moment, my understanding is they charge high fees, so um, you know it's not obvious that it will necessarily be you know the best thing to do. And the question is, do people have the discipline to, in a sense, you know, do that type of annuitization themselves, um, or you know, is it better to pay, pay some of this fee? But if you look at the wealth they have, I mean, literally one quarter have less than twenty-five thousand dollars. The rest of the wealth is in the house, and they've been buying larger homes, so. You know, they'll have to do something with this home. And we do see, in fact, I mean, the evidence perhaps, uh, you know, Mike Kerr would then probably agree with this, but I think the evidence is uh, from uh, many other studies that people are reluctant to uh, down, uh, downsize. So uh, something I think will have to happen for, to allow these people to uh, afford the, their retirement. I am someone who's right at that particular point that you talked about on the cusp, and I am stunned, may I say, by some of the numbers that you have thrown up here of the cohort of which I am a member. Uh, I'm particularly uh, noting the large percentage of debt uh, and also uh, houses underwater and so on. And I'm just reflecting on how, at this stage of life, have these people gotten into this situation? What, I mean, uh, the anecdotal evidence would suggest that everybody's closet by the time you're 50 is already overloaded with stuff. What more is there to buy and so on? I'm worried that uh, the wage picture coming off of the Great Recession 
has been stagnant, and I'm, I'm sure that there's much more unemployment in this cohort than the national average would suggest. So this is actually quite perilous, it would seem to me, for the, uh, for the cohort, not to say the nation. But my question, in the work that you've done in establishing these numbers, did you, uh, given your expertise in financial literacy, reflect on or find any information as to why has this cohort gotten in such a perilous condition? What are they buying? Uh, uh, with, and uh, is it that we're just buying houses too large, for instance? So I can only speculate because we don't have a panel. We haven't followed those people over time. Uh, and I can only speculate from some of the other studies we have done, for example, linking financial literacy to some specific decisions. Um, I think one potential reason here, and again, this is a speculation, is that the access to borrowing and making borrowing so easy has worked. Um, you know, we certainly, I think, have made borrowing a lot easier than saving. So, you know, if you think with the subprime mortgages, in a sense, and the reason why, in my view, financial literacy is important, one of the similarity between the subprime mortgages and the credit card is that it's up to the borrower to decide the amount, right? With the subprime mortgages, you know, the banks weren't looking anymore, in a sense, at your asset and your capacity to borrow, so it's that, that decision is shifted a lot more on the borrower. And so it has happened with the credit card, for example, certainly before the financial crisis, where people were getting a lot of credit card at home. And so it was possible more than before, for example, to increase the amount of debt that you can have. So we have done previous work. Adair was, focus, was uh, asking me about this earlier, for example, about uh, debt um, and the link of financial literacy, for example, also to short-term debt, also over the life cycle. And we do see that financial literacy is very linked, for example, with credit card debt and also this high-cost method of borrowing. In my view, another evidence um, of uh, you know, this demand for debt is this incredible growth of this high cost method of borrowing. Um, there is a paper that shows statistics that in the state that allow them, payday loan have more storefront than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. So there seems to be a high demand, in a sense, to borrow, even at this high cost. Um, so, you know, and, and we have consumer credit has made, the opening of consumer credit has made this possible. Um, if you combine this with the fact that people have low financial literacy, perhaps, you know, that's not, of course, the only explanation. As you said, there are, you know, this is such a complex explanation that I, I just don't really want to oversimplify the story. But if I have a chance to highlight the importance of financial literacy, I'll take it.